Hello again. My name is Katie. I am back reading No Bad Parts by R Richard C. Schwartz, Healing Trauma and Restoring Wholeness with the Internal Family Systems Model. And we are on Chapter 4, More on Systems. You may have noticed that as we proceed through this book, we're focusing less on each individual part and more on their relationships with one another. I feel blessed that when I first encountered the parts in my clients, I was steeped in what's called systems thinking, and that helped me listen to them better rather than being overwhelmed by the complexity of it all. I could focus on the recurring patterns of interaction and could make sense of that. For example, I quickly saw how when a bulimic client's critic started in on her, it triggered another that felt worthless, young, alone, and empty. Then, as that one was making the client feel its feelings, to the rescue came the binge and took her away. After the binge, however, the critic returned with a vengeance, now attacking her for having binged. This, of course, triggered the young one again, and my client was caught once more in that terrible cycle. In this chapter, I'm going to cover some basic ideas of systems thinking that apply to the inner world. The information will help your inner world tremendously, and I'll be drawing on some of this material for the rest of the book. The growth of systems thinking. Systems thinking was originally developed by biologists in Europe in the 1920s who found that the method of studying cell biology by learning the laws of physics for each cell, that is, by using the traditional mechanistic reductionistic approach, was adequate for understanding how cells relate to each other to form living organisms. They found that the behavior of the whole system couldn't be understood from the study of each part in isolation, i.e. outside of the context of the whole system. Hence the famous saying that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The system's view rapidly spread to other fields and spawned the science of ecology, which studies animals and plant communities, and cybernetics, which in introduced concepts like feedback loops, self-regulation, and homeostasis. This shift from studying the makeup of objects in isolation to focusing on how the ob objects are embedded in networks or patterns that can be mapped does not come easily to us because we've been raised in a more mechanistic and reductionistic paradigm. The drawing I had you create in, your, in the mapping your parts exercise is one such way to map out a system. When I first encountered systems thinking in 1976, I was thrilled to find an alternative approach to life that answered many of the questions I had about the failings I was recognizing in psychiatry. Reading Gregory Bateson and other systems theorists produced an epiphany that led me to become a family therapist and later to develop IFS. The big insight was that giving a troubled person a psychiatric diagnosis and seeing that as the sole or main cause of their systems was unnecessarily limiting, pathologizing, and could become self-reinforcing. When you tell a person they are sick and ignore the larger context in which their symptoms make sense, not only do you miss leverage points that could lead to transformation, but you also produce a passive patient who feels defective. Fortunately, most people in the field are beginning to view psychiatric diagnosis as unhelpful and unscientific. Context is everything. Systems thinking focuses on the ways members of a system relate to one another. When you approach symptoms through that lens, you often find that they are manifestations of problems in the structure, the patterns of relationship, of the systems in which the person is embedded, family, neighborhood, work, country, etc., as well as the system that is embedded within them, that is, their internal family. I learned as a family therapist that understanding and improving a family structure was a far more effective and lasting way to help a child stop acting out than simply diagnosing and treating them without considering their family context. I also found that these family structures were often maintained by extreme beliefs or emotions that were not necessarily overt but were constantly felt. For example, some of the bulimic patients' families held the belief that conflict was dangerous and the parents would become frightened whenever it arose. There was often a general disdain for neediness or vulnerability too, and the belief that the family needed to present a perfect image to the outside world. Whatever the set of beliefs and, or, and emotions 
it became a family paradigm that organized the way the members related to each other, showing contempt when the patient was hurt, angry, or wanted attention, for example. Larger systems are no different. The structures of corporations and countries will usually remain the same despite their dysfunctions and symptoms unless they experience a change in their basic beliefs. They're paradigmatic operating systems. In the U.S., we'd much rather rearrange the deck chairs, taxes, environmental and immigration policies, etc., on our national Titanic than reevaluate the underlying beliefs for people, for example, unlimited growth, that drive us all. <clears throat> Negative and mistaken views of human nature. The most powerful beliefs that govern a society include the ones about human nature and the way the world works. These are often understated and unchallenged because they are assumed to be reality, just the way things are. As Donella Meadows states, growth is good, nature is a stock of resources to be converted to human purposes. Evolution stopped with the emergence of Homo sapiens. One can own land. These are a few par of the paradigmatic assumptions of our current culture, all of which have utterly dumbfounded other cultures who thought them not the least bit obvious. Most of a society's rules and goals trickle down from its assumptions about whether people are basically good or evil, competitive or collaborative, trustworthy or selfish, isolated or interconnected, hopeless or redeemable, inferior or superior, all of these views affect a given society's members. You're probably familiar with the placebo effect, but the opposite, called the nocebo effect, is equally real and powerful. For example, if you believe a sugar pill will make you sick, you'll probably get sick. Applied to human relations, there is ample evidence that our negative expectations of others have a strong negative impact on their behavior or performance. This can easily initiate vicious reinforcing feedback loops in which negative expectations become self-fulfilling prophecies that further reinforce the negative views and so on. This is one reason why racism is so pernicious. As discussed in the introduction, the view of humanity that has dominated the Western world t trends toward the pessimistic. In order to justify slavery, white Europeans started to differentiate themselves from other less civilized cultures. We might all struggle with primitive impulses, but according to that paradigm, some typically darker people were not as, as skilled at controlling their irrational bestial parts. This veneer theory of controlling the primitive can be applied not only to impulses, but also to people. One theme of this book is that how we think about and relate to the inhabitants of our inner worlds translates directly to how we think about and relate to people. If we live in fear of and strive to control certain parts of us, we will do the same to people who resemble those parts. The veneer theory suggests that civilizations forms, civilization forms the protective layer necessary to contain and hide all our prim primitive instincts that are constantly wanting to break through. Historian Rutger Bregman asserts that in contrast to the veneer theory, people are basically good. He debunks the research of notable thinkers such as Richard Dawkins, Philip Zimbardo, and Stanley Milgram, all of whom held extremely pessimistic and highly influential views about people. When Bregman took a second look at the methods and data from their famous studies, he found enough rampant distortion and falsification to discredit them outright. Bregman's argument is that we have organized all our institutions based on this selfish view of people and that if we realized that wasn't true, everything would change. Once we shift paradigms to the knowledge that at their essence, everyone is decent and kind, we can recognize our economic systems, schools, and prisons. We can reorganize our economic systems, schools, and prisons. He offers many examples of successful institutions and programs that are based in, on the positive view of human nature. The prison system in Norway, for example, that has the lowest recidivism, recidivism rate in the world. In contrast to American prisons, guards in Norway are taught to make friends with the inmates and help prepare them for normal life.
Meanwhile, the number of people incarcerated in the U.S. has grown over 500% since 1972 to the point where the U.S. jails are almost a quarter of the world's prisoners. Speaking of racism, nearly 60% of those prisoners are Black or Latinx. <coughs> Clearly, our veneer-based approach of control and contain isn't working. What if it was true that there are no bad parts, only burdened ones frozen in the past that needed to be unburdened rather than punished? What if, at their essence, everyone was a self that could be assessed quickly? How would the world be different? Why the negative view doesn't work. Going to war against, coercing, harshly punishing, or shaming, for example, any social problem sets in motion, reinforcing feedback loops that have the potential to destroy the system because they escalate over time and drain the system's resources. This is true in the inner world as well. Going to war against protector parts only makes them stronger. Listening to them and loving them, however, helps them heal and transform. The challenge here is that we are dominated individually and collectively by hardline punitive parts who believe that people and their parts are basically bad and need to be warred against. If you believe that within within you are if you believe that within you are dangerous bestial or sinful impulses that need to be constantly monitored, controlled and if necessary battled against, the veneer theory adopted for the inside world then it makes sense that you would see other people that way and your approach to social problems will invariably involve controlling tactics and war. Time and again, we've seen how leaders of one country demonize the people in another land to justify going to war against them. Excuse me. As, Charles, as Charles Eisenstein puts it, there are so many fights, crusades, campaigns, so many calls to overcome the enemy by force. Thus, it is that the inner devastation of the Western psyche matches exactly the outer devastation it has wreaked upon the planet. I developed IFS while working with clients suffering from eating disorders, where the most common approach to treating these people remains focused on defeating their disorder with expected results. Our cultural war on drugs as well has been an unmitigated disaster with massive unintended consequences throughout the world. We need a new approach based on no longer trying to kill the messenger and instead listening to the message, no longer going to war against nature or human nature. This view that people have a sinful, aggressive, selfish, impulsive nature that must be controlled by their rational minds or by, the help, by help from God also leads to a profound sense of disconnection from other people and disdain for oneself. If everyone is out for themselves, then you should be too. You have to protect yourself. You shouldn't be too open or na and naive. You need to watch your back. The only problem there is that this approach doesn't work. It only leaves you feeling lonely, ashamed, and afraid, feelings you think you have to hide for fear of being rejected. When you believe you are a separate, selfish, and sinful soul among other wretches like yourself, it's hard to not feel lonely even when with people. When you're alone with your, with your pathetic self, you feel even more rejected and worthless and consequently are likely to withdraw even more. What if, instead, you knew that your loneliness was held by another part of you? What if you identified with yourself rather than your exiles? And what if you saw the self in everyone around you? Feedback loops. I spoke about legacy burdens in chapter one. There are four in particular, racism, patriarchy, individualism, and materialism that have dominated our country's mindset since the founders brought them from Europe. Each of these legacy burdens combines with the others to create the pervasive sense that we are all disconnected and on our own in a dangerous dog-eat-dog -dog world. In turn, they create what system theorists call a reinforcing feedback loop. The sense of com competitive separateness and the belief that anyone with enough willpower can make it leads people to exile and disdain those who do less well than them. In turn, this creates even more separateness and fear for survival in the system, which leads to more exiling and so on. One reinforcing feedback loop that is common in all kinds of systems is called success for the successful. As applied to 
As applied to our country's division of wealth, we find that those with more privilege, accumulated capital, inside information, and special access and influence are able to create more privileged capital access and information. On the other hand, those without those advantages become exiled, and as such, they and their children get worse educations, have trouble getting loans with reasonable interest rates, and are subject to redlining practices, and are discriminated against because of race or class. Furthermore, their voices are rarely heard by politicians, who are typically more concerned with the influential members of society, i.e. the wealthy. Unfortunately, as Meadows warns, a system with an unchecked reinforcing feedback loop ultimately will destroy itself. However, there is another important kind of feedback loop in all living systems that is necessary for their survival. Organisms need to maintain homeostasis, or steady state, in various vital processes. For humans, these include body temperature, blood sugar, oxygen levels, blood pressure, etc. When any of the, those variables go outside of the healthy range, receptors are triggered, setting in motion a feedback process which brings the variable back within, within it. In contrast to reinforcing feedback loops, which result in escalations of a variable, those that restore homeostasis are called stabilizing or ba balancing feedback loops. For example, if your blood sugar levels get too high, your pancreas is notified to produce more insulin until your sugar level returns to a healthy range. If we think of the Earth as a living system or being as Gaia, then the COVID-19 pandemic could be seen as part of a stabilizing feedback loop. For 99% of human history, the human species has not been a dire threat to the health of the planet. Starting with the Industrial Revolution, the world's human population and its ability to exploit the planet's resources has exploded in the last two centuries. Since the late 1880s, we've been riding on different runway reinforcing feedback loops, and because they've improved the lives of most people in tangible ways, we've been con become convinced of the myth of the march of progress. Unfortunately, the march hasn't been so progressive for the rest of the planet. Through our extra extractive, exiling, and disconnecting attitudes and behaviors, we've lost our ability to feel the earth viscerally. Our receptors are numb to the feedback the earth has been offering us for decades, telling us time and again that she isn't happy or healthy. It's not that she hasn't informed us, there have been plenty of signs, it's that the striving, coercive parts that come to dominate much of our species have been too focused on financial and material gain to help to heed those signs. We stopped caring about the earth and instead viewed her as a set of resources to be used however we wanted, and there are consequences to this. That brings us back to the pandemic. As a group of biodiversity experts notes, rampant deforestation, uncontrolled expansion of agriculture, intensive farming, mining, and infrastructure development, as well as the exploitation of wild species have created a perfect storm for the spillover of diseases from wildlife to people. They warn that 1.7 million unidentified viruses known to infect people are estimated to exist in mammals and water birds. Any one of these may be more disruptive and lethal than COVID-19. They suggest that a beginning step is for countries to recognize complex interconnections among the health of people, animals, plants, and our shared environment. Additionally, we need to prop up healthcare systems in the most vulnerable countries where resources are strained and underfunded. In other words, they are asking leaders of countries to become systems thinkers. Maybe climate crises and viruses are built in stabilizing feedback mechanisms that kick in whenever our species exceeds the planet's homeostatic range. The speculation may come across as cold-blooded, and I certainly don't want to diminish the unbelievable amount of suffering and death the pandemic has caused throughout the world to date. My primary intention here is to make a plea for us to quickly learn the lessons of this crisis so we can end it as quickly as possible and avoid worse disasters in the future. If our species can finally get the message and shift our values and priorities, maybe we can avoid worse stabilizing feedback from Mother Earth. Maybe we can start listening to and respecting her again, but we can't do that without a dramatic paradigm shift. Our fate isn't in our own hands, it's in our minds. Everything is connected. <clears throat> hmm. 
As Eisenstein urges, we must discard the story of separation and adopt, and adopt the story of interbeing. We need systems thinking leaders who can remind everyone that we're all in this together. I often ask clients to have their polarized parts come together to talk directly to one another. The first question I have the client ask each part is whether they have anything in common. Each part is often shocked to learn that they share the desire to keep the person safe, but their ideas about how to do that are totally different. With the realization that they are interconnected, they become committed to working together for the well-being of the larger system, the client, they both inhabit. Likewise, helping people and families, companies, countries, and internationally realize their connectedness brings forth the self at each of those levels, and the self always brings healing. Meadows reminds of us of how we are all interconnected. No part of the human race is separate either from other human beings or from the global ecosystem. If the planet's climate collapses, everyone will suffer, even the rich. If the workers in a company are overstressed, the company will fail and the owners will go bankrupt. If you are dominated by your brain and neglect the rest of your body, you will get sick and your brain will go down with the ship. Having a huge poor Having a huge poor population either drains most of the country's resources or creates violent social upheaval. If you exile your vulnerable, vulnerable parts, they will destroy you. The shift. Currently, we view, view ourselves and our fellow humans as fundamentally selfish and flawed, which leads to dog-eat-dog, -dog, ruthless economic and social systems. <clears throat> and because we approach our problems out of context, that is, non-systemically, our attempted solutions to those problems often make things worse, namely harming the planet and creating masses of exiled people. Exiling is toxic to any system. It severs our connection to each other, to our own bodies, to the earth, and to the divine. Our inner world is also polluted by this paradigm. Our treasury of parts ends up mirroring the external system with lots of exiles, lots of protectors who disdain them, and with our burdens as the fundamental organizing principle of our inner system as opposed to ourself. Clearly, this way of being with ourselves and the world is not sustainable. Here's the alternative paradigm that I'm proposing. Within each of us is a wise, compassionate essence of goodness that knows how to relate harmoniously. In addition, we're not one messed up mind, but an internal system of parts. Sure, these parts can sometimes be disruptive or harmful, but once they're unburdened, they return to their essential goodness. And because this is true, each of us has a clear path in front of us to access and lead our lives, inner and outer, from that essence. In doing so, we realize the basic truth of interconnectedness on all levels, and the natural result of that realization is compassion and courageous action. I know it sounds like a lot, but making this paradigm shift doesn't actually require huge sacrifices or suffering. It can be painful to retrieve parts of yourself that you left in the dust, but the effort is more than worth it. Here's just a taste of what you have to gain. More love for yourself and others, more access to your inner joy and delight, as well as your rich sadness and grief, and more meaningful habits and activities with a sense of fulfilling vision. Exercise. Daily IFS Meditation. Here's a meditation that I and other IFS practitioners use to foster this paradigm shift within us. I encourage you to practice some version of it on your own every day. Start by taking a second to get comfortable. If it helps you to go inside to take some deep breaths, go ahead and do that. If you've tried out the exercises early in the book, hopefully you now, hopefully by now you're getting to know a handful of your parts. I'm going to invite you to focus on the ones that you're getting to know first. And the goal of focusing on them is really just to follow up and see how they're doing, and if there's anything they need, if there's more they want you to know. This is all in service of building an ongoing relationship with your parts so they feel more connected to you, less isolated and alone. Okay, let's take some breaths.
at some point, remind them that you're there with them, that you care about them, and tell them a little more about who you are, because even as you work with parts, they often forget these things until they've been unburdened. And it never hurts to just remind them that they're not alone anymore, and that you're not a young child anymore, and that you can care for them in a way they need. The goal is to take your parts as seriously as you take your literal children if you have children. The good news is that your parts don't need nearly as much maintenance or nurturance as literal, literal children do. They often just need to know about this connection you're building just to be reminded of it. Then at some point you can expand your purview and invite any other parts that need attention to come to you. On different days, different parts will show up. Just get to know them and what they need from you and also let them know who you are and that they're not alone anymore. And then this next piece is optional in each meditation. If you'd like to, you can revisit each of these parts, inviting them to relax inside an open space just for a few minutes and ask them to trust that it's safe to let you more into your body. Their energy tends to make it harder for you to be embodied when they're triggered. And if they're willing to let you in more, you'll notice a shift each time they relax. You'll feel more space inside your body. Remind them that it's just for a few minutes, that it's just an experiment to see what happens if they let you be there more. They don't have to if they don't want to, in which case you can just continue to get to know them. But if they are willing, notice the qualities of this increase in spaciousness and embodiment. Notice what it feels like to be more in your body with a lot of space. You might notice a shift in your breathing or your ability to be present. You might feel your muscles relax and a sense of well-being, like everything's okay. And as I said before, you might also notice a kind of energy running through your body, making your extremities tremble a bit or tingle. I'm very auditory, so I can also notice a shift in my tone of voice while I'm in this state. I also enjoy the peace that comes with the lack of a pressing agenda. If your parts are having a lot of trouble relaxing, it just means that they need more of that kind of attention at some point. So let them know you get it, that there's no pressure for them to do anything. When the time feels right, you can begin to shift your focus back out here. Thank your parts for whatever they let you know and remind them you're going to do this practice more in the future. Take some deep breaths if that helps you come out. As I go through my day, I often pause and notice how much I'm in this state. When I'm not, it means there's some part that's taken over or is at least more active and I can quickly find that part and remind it that it's safe to trust me, that it can relax a little bit and open more space. It's taken a while, but almost in every situation now, my parts do that pretty readily and I can feel the energy again in the spaciousness and I can relate to people from that place. This becomes a daily practice. In addition to noticing the parts and helping them trust that it's safe to open space, it's usually necessary to actively work with them and do some healing because as long as your system is vulnerable, it'll be hard for them to trust you. So in combination with this meditation, I and other IFS practitioners will actively do sessions to unburden parts. Okay, we made it to chapter five, mapping our inner systems. I'm super excited about this chapter chapter because I love mapping. Um, and yeah, I guess that's all I have to say. Thanks for joining me. This is No Bad Parts, and I will see you again soon for the next chapter. Bye.